Hello everyone, welcome to the Death Stranding 2 reveal trailer. I am TLGTW, and as you can perhaps tell, this is not an episode of Elden Ring Explained with Snake Eyes Teieruji. Indeed, this video is part of the greater Birth Month. November, the month in which I was born, where I do whatever I want. And today, that's this. Now, this video will not be particularly long, or complex, or even gone past my first draft compared to my current other three videos. One, because I am not going to spend more than two days on it, with any luck I'll have spent only one day on this, and two, because I want to see what it's like. As always, thank you to the TLGTW official fan club in helping to make this video possible. To my committee members, with thanks. To my Eye in Gold committee members, Enid the Games Nihilist, and JC of the Bacon Conspectus, with special thanks. And to the rest of my OF, thank you even more. So I burn, consider me yours. So, as we get into this trailer, the first thing we see is perhaps a one of such baby-baffling educational products as we perhaps delivered in standard order number 314 from the first game. On it is a sticker, I love BB, which we do, and on this, like, walking aid toy or whatever it is, we can also spot the Bridges logo just out of frame. As a note, I am willing to state that I've beaten the original Death Stranding three times, and I am pants-shittingly excited for the eventual release of this game. My personal bet is that it'll come out sometime in the last third of 2024, or the first two months of 2025. I have no evidence for this. So Death Stranding 2 takes place at least a few years after the first game, maybe even two years, for as we see, Lou has grown from a seven-month-old infant to a toddler with hair and tall enough for her hands to reach more than two feet in the air. What an achievement, Lou. But what the hell? I thought the UCA used the fucking metric system. Why is this chart in feet? Anyway, what's the significance of the color red here? Most likely, it's just a straight reference to Amelie herself, the figure obviously depicted in this bizarre effigy. Behind Amelie here is something like a cape or wings, in the shape of, I believe, something like an upside-down sunset, or perhaps a depiction of a reflection of a sunset, such as on a surface of water or something like that. Behind Omli's head are a pattern of irregular, rectangular shapes. We'll see what these are very soon. You can also make out these details here that serve to mimic the neckline of her dress. Above these details, below Omli's face here, is what I can only describe as a strange pair of lumps. What are these two round shapes supposed to be? Maybe like the figure of a baby, with the smaller shape being the head, and the larger shape being the body? It's an otherwise really random addition for this otherwise art deco metal figurine. Personally, I'm positive that it must indicate something. In the following scene, we can see this Amelie effigy on the face section of some kind of high-tech red sarcophagus, carried by a number of equally high-tech red cult-like figures. We can see a number of these figures are also carrying staffs bearing an effigy of Amelie as well, and one of the pallbearers here seeming to hold their staff with a mechanical arm, perhaps literally an Odra deck. The main question here, of course, is as to who or what the heck is currently sealed inside this coffin. There is an effigy of Amelie on it, so perhaps it's Amelie, but I think not. As noted by the Amelie figurine being carried by multiple people here, this faction appears to legitimately worship Amelie as some kind of god figure, with her likeness bearing some kind of important symbolic or religious significance. She is an EE after all, so if the faction here considered Amelie something alike to a god of death, it would easily make sense why they'd use her image as decoration for a sarcophagus, rather than being used here as like a label for what's inside the coffin itself instead. As the next scene shows us where the sarcophagus's procession is taking place, I want to make note of specifically the mechanical backpacks every single person here is wearing. Just barely in this scene, we're also able to catch a sideways glance of one of these figures, and we can see that they're not wearing hoods, but helmets. By the aurora borealis seen faintly in the sky, one might assume that this strange scene here is taking place somewhere north of the US, Russia or something. But as we'll remember from the first game, auroras are able to appear anywhere, depending on the state of, like, the beach or Karelium or whatever. So we can't take the aurora as indicative here. 
Because of the mechanical backpacks and helmets I've noted, however, I think this scene is actually taking place somewhere, somehow, without a breathable atmosphere. In other words, in outer space. If I had to make a legit guess, I'd bet that this place was the moon or Mars. But obviously, there's no actual evidence of that. For this reason, I also note the pipe we see here connected to the sarcophagus. Unless I'm mistaken, this pipe is also feeding into, like, a T-junction, specifically. One end going into the coffin, and the other end pointing out. I think the very literal purpose of this mechanism, the pipe itself and the input and output for the coffin, as well as this, like, little status LED here, is for the circulating of air and regulating of air pressure inside what's otherwise a hermetically sealed container. That is to say, in this sarcophagus, I don't think at all that there's actually a dead guy in there. So yeah, these red guys are parading their sarcophagus to some kind of location. And here we see the floating rectangles depicted in the background of the Omli effigy. Surrounded by a number of floating pieces, these two large basalt pillar-like towers make the shape of, for some reason, London Bridge. Although, it would seem here, a London bridge that has fallen down. Hmm. The motif of drawbridges being the thing for this game, as we'll see later in the trailer, perhaps what this structure is is some kind of, like, dimensional gateway. The spiritualist from the first game asserted that the ancient civilization of the world were able to physically build portals into the beach, such as Stonehenge and the pyramids, and with the power of the beach, traverse even outer space. Perhaps this structure exactly is among such gateways as she described, and if somehow, perhaps, if these floating rocks surrounding the structure were used to, say, like, bridge the gap between these stone towers, a portal into the beach will be exactly what these cultists will have. We see Lou again properly this time, obviously a toddler, and we can even make out her name Louise on her bib. And Lou is obviously a slobbery fucking baby, just look at how shiny the area around her mouth is. Despite this, however, Fragile doesn't seem to have any problem looking after her here. Guess you changed your mind on how babysitting sucks from the first game, huh Fragile? Guess you changed your mind about that, because you're obviously babysitting Lou right here, right now. And that's the only notable contradiction from Death Stranding 1 regarding Fragile here. Nothing else to bring up or talk about. Fragile is babysitting. Is that fucked up or what? So Sam's dream catcher is hanging from a fixture in the ceiling, indicating that this is Sam's own prepper shelter, which he no doubt obtained after the ending of the first game where he and Lou desert from bridges. And I just want to say that I love the appearance of this place. We barely got to see the actual interiors of any prep your shelters from the first game outside of like Peter Englert's, which obviously doesn't count, and like maybe Coffin's place, I don't remember, whatever. But looking at the like fake skylight and stuff, it's not so cool. Anyway, as the lights turn on and off here, we catch a glimpse of something very peculiar. Lou's old BB pod being used as, like, a cryptobiote terrarium. And to me, this is absolutely noteworthy. Cryptobiotes, as we know, only appeared during the Death Stranding itself. And during the Death Stranding itself, we saw them just hanging out in the wild among chunks of coral from the beach and kept in ordinary jars. Why isn't something like an ordinary jar being used here, then? Why specifically the pod for a fucking bridge baby? I think the reason, however, is specifically due to the Death Stranding being over. During the Death Stranding itself, when there was Chiralium all over the fucking place, cryptobiotes, which obviously incorporate Chiralium into their bodies on account of their floating, were able to live anywhere, because the presence of Chiralium and Coral mimicked their native habitat of the beach. Now, however, without the Death Stranding, without the world of the living being connected to the beach like it used to, the cryptobiotes aren't able to survive properly outside. And so, the using of the pot of a bridge baby here is specifically to facilitate or simulate the presence of the beach, so that the cryptobiotes inside are able to exist and reproduce without issue. That's why the cryptobiotes are in a BB pod. And this is the kind of person you're fucking dealing with, okay? This is why my Elden Ring videos are like this. It's because I'm just like this.
anyway, let's go on and off. And there's a second bigger dream catcher, maybe even two dream catchers. Like what the fuck, right? Maybe they're meant to represent Lou and Fragile or something. Or maybe they're just in universe meant to be decoration. As Fragile reacts to the lights, we're able to get a good look at the angel wing decorations on Lou's shirt. Very adorable. And by Fragile's expression and hectic movements, we can also tell that she has no idea what's going on. The shelter is being broken into, but she has no idea why or who. And as the red security lights turn on, indicating a break-in, we see her set Lou down to put the harness on her, as we see in the next scene. as she makes her way to the stairs out of the shelter, where she sees, specifically, a flashlight. Anyway, this part is so cool. Fragile uses the fucking standard sanitized bridges cargo elevator to, cir to circumvent the fucking intruder in the entryway. So Fragile climbs in, and one of the intruders shines their flashlight through the grating of the elevator. And before Fragile glances back, we are just barely able to make out the fucking head, or whatever, of the second person with a second flashlight. This person here. The scene is in such low detail that you can't even make out if the character is wearing a fucking helmet or not. What I think can be made out though is specifically the color red. And what can also be made out just after the doors of the elevator itself closes is the distinct orange of what can be assumed to be Apex either holographic Odra deck or the holographic heads of the Apex androids that we see at the very end of the trailer. What do you mean it could just literally be a trick of the light? After Fragile exits the elevator above ground, she sees the flashlights heading their way back up again. So she gets out and she mounts a fucking monocycle. Fuck yes. I cannot tell you how excited I was to see a fucking bike in the game. And look, it only has one wheel, right? You know what that means? That means it has only a single point of contact with the ground. Not two points of contact like the reverse trike needed or the four points of contact that the cars needed. Can you fucking imagine the fucking off-road, narrow-ass passage capabilities of this thing? Like, Jesus Christ. And not just that, but look at how only one side of the bike has a cargo rack. You know what that means? That's right, this thing is gonna be fucking foldable. Just like the floating carrier, and it'll fold into a size L piece of cargo with a seat with the seat and the handlebars pivoting forward and the cargo rack uh, pivoting to in front of the wheel. And do you see that seam on the fucking wheel itself? The wheel might literally be foldable too. Like, are you fucking me, dude? A fucking foldable electric bike? I had an actual dream, like in my sleep, in real life, where there were bicycles and death training. This is basically that. It'll probably drain the shit out of Sam's personal battery too, and that'll be okay. As Fragile escapes, we also see that, like the reverse trike, the monocycle has a specific speed boost mode, where you pull in the handlebars and a number of lights turn on as you lean in to go faster. Shame if she dies. After Fragile is shot and wipes out, a cloaked figure, completely hidden in shadow, points a gun near the camera.
presumably towards Fragile and Lou. Like with the elevator scene, this person here is so occluded that it's impossible to make out any visage whatsoever. But one detail, I think, can be made out. From the gun and the hand holding it, the colors specifically of black with a tint of red. That is to say, I think the wielder of the pistol in this scene is precisely our guitar player from the end of the trailer. With their prominently black and red bodies, I believe that the red tint on this gun is coming precisely from the red bounce lighting off our shooter's red armor. With the cock of the gun, we come to what I think is the actual most mysterious part of this trailer. And I think what this scene is depicting is actually very specific. What appears at first is like the cutscenes we see from the first game when Sam and Lou repatriate, such as after the middle not void out. But when we see Lou's face, she's dripping fucking BT juice. And, most importantly, she doesn't open her eyes and she doesn't give a thumbs up. Tar being expelled from your body is, if I recall correctly, a universal signifier of repatriation. But Lou doesn't open her eyes. And what we see here, Lou herself doesn't even make any movements. Besides signifying repatriation, however, we have one example of tar being expelled from your body, specifically from your eyes. Clifford Unger on the beach. Gunshot sound. There's a fucking gunshot sound as we zoom out and Fragile has awoken. Tar streaming down from her open eyes, not closed ones. It would seem that somehow Fragile has repatriated herself, with some time having passed between her death and actual resurrection similar to the scripted repatriation that Sam undergoes in the first game, such as after Middle Knot and after getting shot by Higgs at Edge Knot. Fragile spots Lou crying and she tries to crawl towards her, but then we see Lou's body, still, as if dead, and Fragile collapses. And that's what I think's happening to Lou here. She's murdered in the world of the living, and she becomes, perhaps in a similar way to how Clifford Unger existed, stranded on the beach. Indeed, Lou's ka separates from her ha, but I don't think Lou becomes a beached thing. For one, the death stranding is still over. Look, normal rainbow with the color blue. It isn't possible anymore for beached things to exist under normal circumstances. Because the world of the living isn't connected to the beach anymore, your ka, your thing, can't get beached. Clifford Unger, however, was never a BT either. Both unharmed by Sam's blood and never actually entering the world of the living himself at any point, only being stranded, as it were, on the beach, I think Lou's Ka now is in a similar situation. Tar coming out of the eyes, signifying resurrection, but without opening her eyes, and without giving a thumbs up. Lou's soul didn't return to the world of the living. It's stuck on her fucking beach. Perhaps even, just like Cliff, prevented from actually moving on to the world of the dead due to her emotional ties to the world of the living. And this is why we see the BT-like apparition of Lou appear, specifically in her old BB pod, back in Sam's shelter. A capsule built for the purpose of bridging the world of the living with the world of the dead. Lou's condition, as what appears like a beached thing, even including specks of chiralium, from the beach, is singularly facilitated by the BB pod acting as a bridge to her beach. And I think it might be that to Louise's beach precisely is where Sam is aiming to go aboard the Magellan. I can't tell you what the fuck her being red is supposed to signify though. Maybe she's also immune to hematic grenades. Baby. Don't worry. It's okay. No one death Stranding 2. The second Death Stranding. But that's only the working title. It's not the finalized title, so it might not actually mean anything yet. So imagine, what if they revealed the final name for the game to be fucking, like, To Death Stranding. To the Death Stranding. In the first game, the Death Stranding came to us. Now, in the second game, we're going to the Death Stranding. On our fucking boat. And yo, is the Magellan not the coolest fucking boat you've ever seen? Fuck me as to why they had to name it after the fucking genocidal conquistador, but it makes you remember how there are literally zero Native Americans Death Stranding 1, doesn't it? Anyway, after the title drop, we see the logo for the company Sam will most likely be working for in this game. Drawbridge. 
as opposed to bridges for the first game. And from its animation, we can actually tell what kind of drawbridge specifically the logo is depicting. As opposed to something like the drawbridge for a castle, this is a drawbridge of equal halves. For a connection between both sides, what's required is the lowering of each half by both sides. The connection between both can be broken on a whim, regardless of what the other side does, whenever one side decides to raise its side of the bridge. But more realistically speaking, the reason for modern drawbridges to raise their halves is specifically to allow ships to pass under them. In this case, an ordinary bridge is turned into a barrier, connecting two pieces of dry land but becoming a wall that prevents the passage of things on the water. The only way for a boat to continue downriver is for the drawbridge to temporarily disconnect, allowing the boat to pass before connecting itself again. Where water was what separated dry land, dry land became what separated water. Should we have connected, right? No one should have to suffer such loss. You know, I meant it when I said I understand how you feel. But if you hold on to the sadness, it'll weigh you down like an anchor. Anyway, after the drawbridge logo, we see Old Man Sam, Metal Gear Solid 4. And of course, a right side up rainbow, still including the color blue, as I mentioned earlier. But where on earth did Sam's sudden aging come from? Personally, I am certain that Sam's aging, that which we can see is not the kind of rapid and irregularly patched aging caused by timefall, comes from, somehow, the time he spent, relatively, stranded on his beach during the ending of Death Stranding 1. He must have spent decades in there, at least. And somehow, although directly after returning to the world, Sam doesn't display any signs of advanced aging, due to all that time having been spent only on the beach, where effectively zero time passes in the world of the living. Something, somehow, has happened now to make that not count anymore. In other words, the various time-warping effects of the beach including Sam's prevention of aging, and including Fragile's rapid aging, have all somehow been undone. By what means? How? Why? No doubt these very questions will be among the ones Sam and Fragile themselves will pursue over the course of Death Stranding 2 itself. Whatever the truth turns out to be, I for one am absolutely certain that the apparent time fuckery seen on Sam and the time unfuckery seen on Fragile must come from the exact same origin point. As we see Sam and Fragile at the entrance of this shelter, we might think that this is supposed to be, somehow, a different shelter than Sam's, that Fragile and Lou try to escape from, from the start of the trailer. I don't think it is, however. Sam's shelter and this one both have similar rocky surroundings. But of course, Sam's shelter didn't have a pool of fucking tar right in front of it, did it? In fact, how can tar even exist, now that the Death Stranding is over? Tar came directly from the beach itself, and while the instances of tar associated with repatriation explain themselves in this regard, what's with all this tar now? I think the answer for this tar, however, lies in what we see firsthand when we fight a BT in Death Stranding 1, and how we see that tar can be summoned from the other side. The one responsible for summoning tar here then, directly in front of Sam's shelter, being none other than the tar-traversing ship, the UHV Magellan. As it rises from the juice, we see the drawbridge logo that, as we see from Fragile in her old suit lacking the logo from Fragile Express from the first game, and her Come Meet My Crew Sam, would appear to be the successor to her old company. We're also able to spot the ship's special logo, one of the three logos that Kojima posted clear pictures of to his Twitter, and as we can see, the sigil of the Magellan depicts a dolphin octopus BT with, notably, three harpoons sticking out of its back. We see a turret bearing a minigun emerge from one of the sides as the camera zooms out before what at first looks like it'll be some kind of massive cannon, instead revealed to be a crane, 
However, I don't think at all that the Magellan is supposed to be any kind of cargo ship, no. Recall its logo, a beast of the water impaled with harpoons. The UHV Magellan is a whaling boat. Here we see Fragile crying. Perhaps she's sad, right? On top of her suit, she's also wearing a strangely styled carrier similar to the one she used for Lou from the start of the trailer. Sam walks past her and the Magellan turns to face the camera. We can see the strange rotating flotation devices that the boat appears to use to navigate through the tar. And from what we know of the tar, that being how it bubbles up from and connects directly to the beach, I think it's a safe assumption to say that the Magellan is specifically a beach hopping ship. Perhaps even something like a BT hunting ship, you know? On the Magellan's deck, we see a matching minigun turret on the other side, and just past the little droid looking thing, we can also make out the Magellan's boarding ramp. I can't, for the life of me though, make any guesses as to how gameplay involving the Magellan will actually fucking look like. Maybe it'll be like, like the base building, like in Metal Gear Solid V. Something like the Magellan in its entirety replacing the numerous standardized private rooms supplied by bridges in Death Stranding 1. Because like, if the Magellan is just able to like, summon a pool of tar anywhere, and like rise out of it, even in front of Sam's house, then like, it'll be able to do that like anywhere, right? That'd be cool, right? It'd be able to do that because that'd be fucking cool as hell, right? Where the fuck is Death Stranding 2 going to take place? Who are we going to be delivering the mail to? I have no fucking idea for that either. Maybe aliens. Europe. I don't know. As we see Sam observing the Magellan though, we see tears flowing from his eyes too. His chiral allergy from his dooms. No doubt in response to the presence of all that tar. I don't doubt that this is what Fragile is crying from as well. Because as we can just barely make out from her in the fucking out of focus ass background, Fragile's carrier thing is holding on to Lou's BB pod. We can tell it's the BB pod, specifically from its orange color and its white glossy reflection. That is to say, if the camera were to go down just a little bit here, what we'd see would be Lou in her parent BT angel form hanging out in there. Because obviously. Obviously, Fragile is not just carrying a container of crypto biotes strapped to her chest with, like, whatever the fuck this hand-themed baby carrier apparatus thing is. So obviously it's like Lou in there, Shadow Lou. Also, why is Sam naked? Where's his shirt? Gotta respect the cargo pan drip, obviously, but where's his shirt? Did he just wake up? This is his house, so like, what? Did he just sleep through the entire Fragile and Lou getting murdered thing? Fragile prioritizing escaping above ground obviously makes sense because there'd be no place to escape in the shelter itself. So I wonder if that is somehow actually what happened. Fragile gets fucking shot while Sam is just waking up to witness Shadow Lou materializing in her old BB pod in the wreckage of his living room, right? It wasn't the UCA that made the final decision. It was APAC, a private corporation. APAC, Automated Public Assistance Company. What the fuck is supposed to be this final decision, huh? We have no idea, but whatever this final decision is or was, Apex's thematic presence here is clear. Quote, it wasn't the UCA that made the final decision. Okay, so in the context here, it must have been evidently assumed somehow by someone incorrectly that the UCA did make this final decision, whatever it is. Instead of the UCA, however, it was actually APAC. In other words, where the UCA appeared in control about something, the group that was actually in control was APAC. APAC then is obviously more powerful in some important way than the UCA itself. Looking at APAC's logo, it's clearly meant to be some kind of maritime organization. It's a compass, and one of the A's is also a compass. As we're also told, APAC is a private organization, or is it? Public assistance, not just public assistance, automated public assistance. And automated is a little spooky here, isn't it? To quote Die Hardman, back before the Death Stranding, the comms and delivery networks were what held society together. The whole thing was automated, AI managed, deliveries carried out by drone. 
The belief was that taking people out of the equation would revolutionize the whole system. But things didn't quite pan out that way. Instead, we started seeing cases of what would eventually be dubbed drone syndrome. It was too much for some folks to accept, leaving everything to machines and nothing for the common man. And indeed, the oxytocin deficiency and hormonal imbalances we confirmed seemed to back up that assessment. Humanity needed to be part of the process, so laws were put in place, and we stepped back into the picture again. We stepped back into the picture again. Since this is Die Hardman saying this, we obviously means bridges. In other words, the UCA. So, with the UCA stepping back into the picture again, who was in the picture before? Automated public assistance, deliveries and communications, AI managed and delivered by drones. This company, I think, exactly was APAC. A company from before the Death Stranding. In that case, meaning a company older than Bridges and the UCA itself. As we know, Bridget Strand, born an extinction entity, obviously did not become Vice President of the United States as soon as she was born. What this does is give us a very open window of opportunity, a hole in the story, a plot hole, you could even say, it wouldn't be inaccurate, to be filled in regarding how the automated public assistance company is somehow connected to the extinction entity. The window from when APAC was in control, and before, as Die Harden puts it, we stepped back into the picture again. So if APAC really is that old, and still an international company, then compared to the much younger, completely landlocked UCA, one can easily imagine how APAC here would be somehow the more powerful force. Obviously, I don't actually have any proof. All I can really say is that APAC is absolutely, positively, totally, without a doubtively, almost certainly, the precise company responsible for the situation of the world that led to the development of drone syndrome. What will that actually mean for the story itself? I just wish I could play the game right now and find out. They that made the final decision. It was APAC, a private corporation. So let love warn you. Till the Finally then, after the introduction of APAC, the trailer's penultimate scene, the masked guitar player, voiced by Troy Baker. We don't know for absolute certain if this figure here, no doubt cousin to fucking Jetstream Sam, is Troy Baker, and subsequently Troy Baker's character, Higgs. But like, he sings the song and shit, and he strums the guitar, and most importantly, his voice is slightly muffled under his mask. So let love warn you till the morning. So yeah, somehow this is fucking Higgs. Although clearly not in any kind of straightforward way, I can certainly say that. With this strange, like, android body, this bizarre tentacle-like holographic odor deck, and backed up by a squad of similar android bodies with holographic heads, Robo Higgs and his massive shoulders are definitely doing something insane right here. Since these APAC droids too are so prominently red, it might be accurate to assume that the red Alam Lee cultists we saw at the start of the trailer are somehow directly related to APAC as well. The strap for this guitar shares a number of symbols with the red sarcophagus. Maybe even Higgs himself is in that sarcophagus. After all, my alleged Robo Higgs here is an Amelie effigy already, bearing Amelie's hair and wearing a red mask in the shape of her face. And from his clear detail, I wonder if this mask is supposed to be something like a legit death mask or something like that. Our mysterious guitar player strums his guitar and we see a flash of energy when he does so. Similarly, I think, to how Higgs used his mask to channel his powers in the first game, it would seem this guitar is something like that too. In response, the holographic faces of the androids behind him turn into exclamation marks before becoming aggressive snowflake shapes. And then the guitar player begins to take off his mask, revealing to us our final important detail. He's white. Whoever this masked musician is, 
they're white. That and they don't have Higgs tattoos on their forehead. We can also just make out their eyebrow here before the scene ends. And Higgs doesn't even have eyebrows either. He shaved them off. So we know three things for absolute certain about our guitar player here. They don't look like Higgs and they're white. If I had to guess, I'd even predict that this person's face just straight up looks like Amelie's. Imagine seeing Troy Baker's voice come out of that. Also, the shape the holographic Odor deck takes, pointing at the camera, is the same shape our Odor deck takes in Death Stranding 1 when we're fighting a BT in an arena. So I wonder who it's pointing at. What's the deal with Octopus Lou? We even know that's supposed to be her name because Kojima tweeted a pic of it, specifically naming it Octopus Lou. Is there any kind of clue or anything that might give us an idea of what's supposed to be happening here? Maybe not. My guess is that this scene is a fake out. I think this is from a Dooms related nightmare cutscene or something similar being shown out of context. Similar to like that fucking cutscene with the crabs and the whale and shit from Death Stranding director's cut was announced. Also placed at the very end of the trailer if I'm recalling correctly. In the background of this shot, we can make out panels, so this scene is taking place somewhere indoors. Because of that, I think this cutscene is taking place in the interior of the Magellan as well. PlayStation, maybe place my balls. I don't know. That's the end of the trailer, though. I hope you enjoyed watching this. I'll see you in whatever I make next for birth month. Might not even be a video, it might be anything. So you better enjoy it. Because once December rolls around, I'll be back to Elden Ring Grind, and I'll be boring again like I usually am. Help me keep my head on fire, as you've seen here, by supporting me on Coffee, joining my OF. For $6 members and up, releasing with this video will be the script I used in all its unedited glory, because I've already spent enough time writing it. Issue 0, the first issue of the members only kind of monthly newsletter, is out, available to $3 members and up, so get your mitts on that. And as a reminder, the upcoming second issue of the newsletter, issue 1, is going to be permanently free. So get your mitts on that as well when I release it. And send me fucking questions too, okay? I only got two questions for issue 0. I want more. I want more. Send me more. Email me questions to officialtlgtw at gmail.com. You know the fucking SBS question corner from One Piece? is that. Treat it like that. I don't care whether or not you think your potential questions are or are not relevant to fucking anything, okay? That's for me to decide. Fire burns everything. And wish me a happy birthday, because I was born this month, and after this month, when December rolls around, no longer will I be fucking 22. I'll be 23. So send me questions. And since issue one is going to be free, you'll all be able to read the answers when they come out. So I'll be yours, older, and I'll see you around.